Hey, what's up? This is Daniel Montero with Ganja Smoke Break. Uh, we're here in Miranda. We've been here all day barbecuing, smoking, having a good time amongst friends. And it really pleases me that uh, my buddy Kevin Joji made time out of his busy international schedule. I mean, the guy's going to Colombia and back and Israel and back. And it just makes me really happy that we're here together, Kevin. We get to talk. Um, our conversation is going to go in um, uh, an unknown direction. And Kevin doesn't need an introduction. I know that by the end of our conversation, um, you're going to really understand why Kevin has set himself apart in this industry. And uh, part of it, from my personal experience, is having the ability to, to forecast, to have your mind in the future, and to anticipate what the landscape's going to be instead of struggling to uh, catch up with the trend. And I remember um, the perp, I, I remember was the last time that you said you're going to be behind a trend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember those days, Kev? I do, I do. 100 and years ago? Yeah, it feels like 100 years ago. But when the perp first popped out, it, it wasn't hot. And it, it, it was, it kind of fluctuated. Actually, it was slow at first because people weren't used to buying small pounds of purple. And then all of a sudden it shifts into this, into this monster. But I didn't like it that much. Like it was good grass, but I still had a lot of these older varieties that I thought would just kill her. And a lot of people still like to smoke it, but we didn't really understand, and I'll say we, me, me to me, didn't understand that it was fulfilling a niche that I didn't, under, I didn't understand. That it, it fit a very uh, specific demographic and it fit a very specific time. And it changed cannabis profoundly in the way people purchased. And it just made me realize that, that it was now, a, 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 I wanna say a commoditized product and that it had changed from being niche into something that was much bigger. And if you miss that, you really, you miss, you miss the success. And the, the thing is that you, you have to catch the success or you can't sustain business. You know, for lifestyle, you can do what you choose. You, you can smoke whatever you want your whole life. But if it's not able to generate uh, funds, your business goes down. And so, uh, yeah, I jumped on that one. And I remember how you were talking about uh, being in Oakland and seeing that, I believe it was a perp under the mm -hmm. street light uh -huh. and how you talked about... You could uh, see through the car window when we got served because we dropped, we dropped, we, we brought a hundred pack down to the bay to drop. And I asked my buddies that were moving it to let me go get served in the street. So we went down off of like uh, East 14th and had the kids run up and it was funny because they were reselling us through the window of the car, the stuff we had brought down the net day before. But it, 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 I just needed to see what the visual on it was that made it work. And it was, it was just so instantly recognizable because the hairs were short and orange, like little carrots. And the coloration had this, this like almost like a iridescence that came off of it. Like when you're looking at a really exotic snake, the colors kind of bounce. And under the street light, it bounced. And so it allowed you to have instant product recognition. And I was like, well, I got you. You could look, as soon as it was in the window of the car, you knew right it was that thing. And, and people were very happy. And it was the beginning of the blunt era, really. And so it was the first herb that really had a heavy sesquiterpene base that allowed you to carry a quality all the way through a, a blunt. And man, it just ripped. Can you tell us a little bit more about your history in Oakland? Or, or maybe uh, uh, being in Oakland? I know you yeah, yeah, there. yeah, Oakland was, Oakland was fascinating, man. I got to Oakland in 87. And it was still uh, basically Coquelin at the time. Oakland was still moving heavy, heavy, heavy weight in powder. And so it, it had this unbelievably um, high amount of money circulating in area that previously hadn't. I think you could kind of compare it to like Miami, but on a smaller level. So Miami was a place that uh, when cocaine came in, the Miami managers lit that place up. And it changed it, 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 it modernized the city. And the cocaine modernized the Bay Area but it also brought with it so much violence and issues. And cannabis was this uh, product that everybody was smoking and enjoying. And you could see people wanting to make the transitions from being in the coke business into being into weed. And I was, I was uh, an exporter at the time where I was getting product from other places and they're moving it out of there. And I started having uh, some really good connections with people that had been long-term Oakland residents. And I'd say like the historic black community. And it was just such a incredible experience for me because the, the Bay Area is such a melting pot, but Oakland was really like to me, like the most established, defined black community in America. And for me as in New England to get to enter it 
and get to experience uh, black culture in a, in a way where they had developed a really nice way of living together. The, the drug war is, is created to me, so that's not their issue. That's, that's something that was put on them as a, uh, an, an issue. But to be part of that time period in the Bay Area when hip hop was just busting loose and uh, cocaine had filled up the streets with money and the people became um, papered so they could start trying to shift into new life. It was the beginning really of like the, the weed era. And the people that I got to meet and hang out with were cool. So it, you know, my, my, one of my first real mentors on how do you spend your day in California was this killer Jamaican cat named Greg. So I met him through my boy Azel. And Azel introduced me to Greggy, and Greggy used to be uh, Bob Marley's herb dealer. And he was a really good soccer player, and he grew up in Jamaica and was buddies with Bob's cousin. And so me and, me and this Jamaican cat hook up, and he turns me on to how do you hang out in the Bay Area. So we used to go to the horse track, and we used to go down into the city and chill at the parks. And it was just a, a really good time, you know? And I, I loved it because I think I was like one of the only white people that I was hanging out with Everyone else was, was black and I had all my Mexican connects that I was doing business with. And so for me, as like, you know, a white New Englander, it was really a gift because I got to see other cultures that were beautiful and I got really taken in by these people and I'm still grateful for that um, acceptance because it let me enjoy a time period when I was young and I got to hang out with some really interesting, wild cats during a really wild time. Can you tell us more about Azel? Yeah, Azel. Azel was a, um, he, he passed away, but Azel was like my older brother. And Azel was a, a really brilliant avionics electrician. So he used to wire jet planes. And he comes to work to do uh, uh, electronics for lighthouses. And so when I got out of the military, I got a job building lighthouses and I would run the construction crew and then Azel, someone they brought in to do the, elect the electrical work. So he and I hook up and, and I'm, I'm in the hustle and he wasn't really in the hustle. He was just connected and he and I hook up and he's just such a beautiful person and he was hysterically funny. So we, we had this great relationship and it was nice because he was from Philly, but he was from Chester. So he was from a hard ass spot in Philly. And that's good. Man, I miss his ass. He, um, he, he's, he's really known for being the Oaktown Pirate. So the, we, we, when the Raiders come back to Oakland, he's like, Kev, he goes, we got to get tickets to the Raiders, right? So we pick up four front row seats on the 30 at the Coliseum. And we walked through the whole Coliseum with the ticket sheet. And we went and sat down and, and looked for seats. And we went all the way down to the front. And we realized that we could have these four seats on the, on the 30 right next to the cheerleaders, unobstructed view. I mean, killer. And we burned a joint and we hung out in the empty Oakland Coliseum, you know, and we, we said, this is our spot. And so we went to, you know, probably 100, 120 Raider games together. And I would bring boys down from Humble County to go kick and we would meet up cats from the Bay and barbecue. And Ezel took on this persona called the Oaktown Pirate where he became um, a black pirate. Except he was that dude in real life. That was the thing, is that he really was the black pirate. But now he was wearing black pirate clothing. And it ended up uh, culminating in where he got, the, he got the job offer to be the uh, Captain Morgan model. And they ended up having a, a, a very unexpected heart attack about a week later. So he passed away a couple years ago. But man, he had a huge influence on my life. And I, I have a couple friends that passed away that I really miss. And he's most definitely one of them. What are one of the lessons, I mean, we've talked various, various times about Azel and, you know, his character and the things that he's imbued upon us. Is there, is there one particular thing that he increased the quality of your life um, that was a result of his friendship to you? Oh, yeah. Azel was, Azel was, see, it's tough, man. Sometimes when you talk about Azel, you have to be careful because people can't believe how wild his brother was. So the things that I can talk about was uh, do your damn thing, you know, be bold, live your life. Uh, don't let other people uh, slow you down. Don't, don't allow other people's fears and issues slow you down. What he, what, he, what he gave me a lesson on one time was, he said, I'm the barometer of your sexual security. 
And I said, in what way? I understand. And he was like, he goes, if you're cool with me, he goes, I know basically you pretty solid with yourself. He said, but if you tripping on me, mostly I know that you tripping on that I'm going to snatch your old lady. And he goes, because like there's the myth, he goes, but I am that dude. He said, so I see that picture. And he said, and so ultimately everyone has to have belief in themselves because that's what resonates. And when you believe in yourself, you see, you see good in other people. You don't have prejudicial issues. You don't have a lot of the ignorance. And it was just about how when you want to be bold and live your life the way you believe you should, and you, you are solid with the decisions, you basically have to say, fuck all y'all and do the damn thing. And that's what I really got out of him was that he was a good man. He couldn't have been a better person. He was so good to kids that didn't have families. <laughs> he put an incredible amount of effort into, he put on all these kid groups. He put on all these music groups. He Coach did, for his kids. Oh, incredible. Dude. He's just a wonderful, wonderful human being. But he was rock fucking hard and he was from Philly. He gave me that same saying too where he said, be like cement. And I said, in what way? He said, you need to harden the fuck up. And I laughed, but that was the truth. It was that he had a rough upbringing in Philly and I had a rough upbringing in, in Rhode Island where I'm from. So we had sim similar common backgrounds. And he realized that that strength is, is what was really gonna allow him to have a quality life. And I was young when I met him. I was probably like 20 and uh, 21. So it was really nice to see someone who was, you know, 10 years older than me, 11 years older than me, that was just sharp and solid and had his shit together and could enunciate the fact that I'm going to do my thing in life and it's going to piss people off. But if I try to make everybody happy, I'm not happy. And is that the point? And because he, because he was doing such a, you know, solid work, with people in, in these kind ways, you were like, well, I got you. You can be all those things. You can be you and be cool. And what you're gonna find is that life isn't really a popularity contest. That a lot of times you're gonna do stuff that whether it's right or wrong, uh, you can't pick it. People hate you when you did it right. People hate you, but they love you when you did it wrong. So basically live your life. And I think that's what I got out of him more than anything was live your life. The number I have of Azel or the first one that popped up earlier today and right now is <clears throat> My first grow house, uh, you had introduced me to Azel, mm -hmm. and he came through with just a power drill. Mel was with him, and he wired it all up. Like, yeah, it yeah. looked so easy. Yeah, covered in gold. He, he was hysterical, man. He would work on high voltage with covered in gold and stuff. You know, he was a brilliant avionics electrician, and that was the thing that he had a whole background on fighter jet work. So when he comes to work at the company doing lighthouses, all that stuff was really, really relatively simple. And he helped me light up my first grow. He, we like I had a, Oh really? Oh yeah, yeah. He wired up my first grow too. I didn't know that. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and I'm in '89. My first indoor, the first outdoor was in the late '70s. But the first indoor was in the Bay Area in '89, and uh, Azel uh, helped me tap into the panel and bring the wires out. And I got to do a lot of work with him on stuff like that. So he was like a, a, a really. Um, I'm not saying inspirational in that sense, but he helped me understand functional electrical work. Because I don't have an electrician background, but I've wired up a lot of stuff, and a lot of it was from basically apprenticing with him. But I remember, I remember when he, we, I said to him, I said, dude, my dude wants you to go set this up. And it was good. It, it, it made it simple for you because you didn't have to drive up. That's really what the basis of it was, was it changed your stability. So Big instead time. of being somebody who had a score, now you could produce and it's way safer. And thank you for that. Oh, easy, brother, easy. It's way safer. It, traveling on the road with the wolves is tough. <laughs> you know what I mean? I remember we were talking about it on the way up with Sean. Uh, I've been making all these trips in the rash. Mm -hmm. The one time he came up to see you, the one time I told him not to leave early. Yes, no, because they, you, you have to, you have to if, you, if you're a sheep, you gotta be in a herd of sheep. Otherwise, you're a lone sheep, <laughs> and there's a lot of wolves. The, the high density, what do they call this? Uh, high intensity drug trafficking zone. This area's got, you know, per person, far more police than anywhere else in California. It's, it's unbelievable. So anytime people come up here to score, it's always dangerous for them, really. And, and that's part of it. That's what, makes, that's what makes the business the business. But having your own scene to be able to produce a little bit of herb for yourself is just a blessing. And you don't have to come up and get any weed. And nowadays you can travel. You can come up here, get a small bag of pot. You can come up, a couple guys in the car, you can all get an ounce from your friend. It's easy, it's legal. I can give you an ounce and there's no repercussions. This is me or you. Almost 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it was a fucking problem. 
And Kev, how do you think your experience in New England um, prepared you inadvertently, you know, not deliberately, for what would become your experience in the cannabis industry, and especially considering what it's become? You know, the, my experience is like what I mean. I got into smoking when I was twelve, and my family was into uh, criminal activity, but not 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 drug dealing. And my neighborhood was was basically training ground for future cats that were going to serve in the patriarchal crime family and the mob. So I was like surrounded by criminality in my neighborhood since I was a kid, and I never thought I was going to become a drug dealer, and. Uh, grow weed, any of that shit. I had no idea. And you start smoking weed. But you had aggressive tendencies growing up. Yeah, I came from a really rough environment. And I mean, fuck, I, I, I caught my, I got like my first real, my first real issue was uh, we, we broke into a house. We used to break into houses and hang out during the daytime. We would skip school and go break into a house and then go hang out. We wouldn't fuck up the house or anything. We'd cook food. We'd watch TV and oh, we'd chill, shit. and then we'd pop out the house and, and go home, and go home like it was a normal school day. And I was in a house, hanging out in a bedroom, watching TV with my two friends, Danny and Kev, and I looked out the window and there was like 14 SWAT cops in full riot gear, about ready to run up in the house. And I said, holy shit. And we went and hid in the closet and when the detective came in, because they opened up the whole house, the detective comes in with the gun and puts it in the closet. My buddy Kev kicks the door and, and breaks the cop's hand and drops the gun in the closet. And he's screaming, they got my gun. And I leap through this hole in the ceiling and I jump so high through the hatch in the closet that I come all the way up into the attic and come right through the bathroom ceiling and rip the whole ceiling out and I'm hanging. And there's cops with guns running everywhere. And we end up all getting caught in the house. But I was probably 12. I mean, I must have been like 66, you know, 70, 78, 79. So I'm, 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 already catching, I'm already catching this kind of case. I go to high school in 1980, and within two weeks of being <laughs> in high school, I get into a fight with somebody. And in this horrible, freakish circumstance, he ends up getting thrown through this plate glass window in, in this fight I'm in with him. So he gets brutally fucked up. So I catch a case there. Then in 83, I catch a case for, for trafficking and uh, cultivation. So like, I was kind of raised in the world I'm still in now. And I think that's why like to me, um, the medical cannabis was something that was beautiful because it, that's what really changed it. It was like I, the world we used to live in really didn't change much for a long time. If you were in cannabis, you were always into wild shit because the nature of what you did was wild. But my background as a kid was, was turbulent and, you know, broken home, um, just uh, turbulent. So it, it primed me perfectly for illegal drug sales. What, what makes today possible was the medical because it let me understand people's needs in a lot of capacities other than making money for trafficking and just want to get high. It let me see all these like little details of cannabis helps you fight for your life. Cannabis sometimes saves your life. And so it was so normalizing and humanizing that it lets me see this picture different. But my, my background, shit, Rhode Island was wild. My kids didn't get raised like this, you know? So like we broke the chain, but and, and I'm never ashamed of where I'm from or where I live because I, I mean, I love Rhode Island and I love New England and I love Oakland Beach, man, because it, it, it's your home. But <laughs> it was wild, bro. I was, I was, by the time I was seven, 16 years old, I had already had multiple felonies. I had a whole series of them. And it wasn't even that I was doing violent shit or anything, it was just what it was. Imagine all my friends, how many cases they had. So most of my partners went to prison for weed, went to prison for other crime. Um, it, I leave New England so that I can get out of the crime. That's when I went in the military. Do you mind talking about your cousin? Is your cousin Skippy Burns? Yeah, yeah, rough. <clears throat> that movie's out. So my cousin, at the time. Do you look up to him? Oh yeah, I live with him. Um, and, and he was a solid dude. He was a solid dude before he got in trouble and he was a solid dude after he got in trouble. But Ralph, Ralph Burns was a, a, a soldier in the uh, patriarchal crime family. 
and he was one of the players that robbed the bonded vault robbery in like 77 for 30 million at that time, which would be about 180 million today. So it was the largest robbery in US history. And they end up uh, getting the money, and my cousin was the one that hid the money. And my cousin catches a, uh, they all, a couple of them get caught. My cousin catches a 200 year sentence, takes the, takes the case, and goes to the joint for the rest of his life, and then you know another one on top of that. And so I used to go with his mom to the prison to visit him, and then I used to go drive her to the prison when I was in the service, and I came home from the service, I would go pick up his mom and drive her to the prison to go visit my cousin. And then me and my cousin would chop it up, but it was my cousin that told me basically to leave Rhode Island and go in the service where I became a diver. Because he was, I was like- I wondering well, what made you join the Coast Guard? Yeah, because he was like, there's nothing here for you. And, he, you know, and, he, and, and, and my cousin was rock hard, I mean, you know, um, TV mafia shit. And so I fully saw the picture that was unfolding around him. And I knew what I was always in trouble. I mean, I'm constantly, and you're, you're, you're on, I was on, I think I was on, you know, probation for majority of my juvenile years. I must have given a 50 piss test during that time from all the criminal shit. Cause every time you get in trouble, they put you through all these programs. So I was already like in, in constant in issue. So my cousin was like, man, there's nothing really here. The economy shot, um, all you really have is crime. And so um, you might want to just get out of here for a while, you know? And I was tripping, so I was like, but this is my home. And he was like, yeah, but you can always come home. He said, just go. And so I took off and it was a great decision. And then I would go see him when I came back. And he ended up getting out of prison after about 20 years where his attorneys were able to prove some kind of political bullshit had occurred during the trial. And it allowed him to get out of prison and he passed away about a year and a half, two years ago. And my mom took care of him for the last couple of years of his life because he uh, had gotten ill. So my mom and him had a beautiful relationship. They were cousins. And uh, Ralph was a, a, a very powerful figure in my life because the thing that let me see the game different than a lot of people was that I was a young dude, but I hung out with some really powerful people when I was young. And it was because they knew who my cousin was that kind of allowed me to enter their lives. And it also kept me safe from people that were really violent predators, <coughs> like violent, uh, murderous dudes that we rolled with. They knew that my cousin was my cousin, so they knew that killing me wouldn't be a good thing. So it didn't mean I wouldn't get my ass beat if I was mouthy. So you still had to like handle your shit and be normal, but you weren't gonna suddenly be found floating in the water. So and my cousin protected me just by the fact that everyone knew that we were related. My cousin never had to talk to anybody because if my cousin was talking to you, there was a problem. And it, it, it gave me uh, protection in the sense that it let me not have to get preyed on by the other wolves in the neighborhood. And then it let me meet all these other players and get an education on the hustle from cats that were really smart. So I mean, I used to go home from school in high school and, and go over to all these gangster ass friends of mine's houses and, and bring my book bag and shit and show these kids cats been to school in a minute. And we would hang out and I would learn all about weed and I'd learn about the drug game and I'd learn about collecting money and you'd learn all the details of the the business and then you'd see how they, people behaved and how real players were good to each other. And that most of the time if you, you can kind of judge people by how, the, how long they've been friends with people. So if you, have a, if you can maintain many long-term friendships, the odds of you screwing people over is probably slim. And so you kind of see that. You get to see the relationships and the cement and how those things are what's crucial for long-term success in life. So my, like my cousin opened all those doors for me, really, without ever opening any of them because he had nothing to do with anything I did. He wasn't in the drug business. He was in different business. He was in the mob business. Is that like Lao Tzu, in a way? Opening doors without opening doors? Yeah, to a degree, it's an occasion. It's just, it's just in life sometimes, you know, your affiliations create um, opportunity, but they also create a, a pathway. And as long as you, and I wasn't using it. See, I wasn't ever, I was never announcing I was Skip's cousin or any of that shit, I never did. It was just that we all were close neighborhood and in neighborhoods, everybody knows each other. So when people would introduce me to other people, other dudes that were hard would introduce me to other hard dudes and say, that's uh, Ralph Burns' cousin. People would, would know that my family was uh, uh, solid. And they would also know that 
um, I wasn't a mark to be robbed or murdered because my family wouldn't tolerate that shit. So in, 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 in the New England crime world, in, in terms of like the neighborhoods were rough, man. They were different than, that's why it lets me go to a lot of these crazy places in life because the neighborhood was rough. And I think that it, that's, it lets you kind of understand the struggle of people anywhere you go. That ultimately when the resources are less, people resort to what they need to to make it. And the idea really is to increase the resources so people don't have to. And see, that's why I love your equity program. I like the work you do with the equity because it's, it's trying to create some level of parity, some fairness for people who have been peeled. And you end up finding crime rates decrease dramatically, education success rates go up dramatically, um, less alcohol consumption, less child abuse, less, less issues, period, because the stress isn't making people kind of pervert. And so in, in essence, uh, Skip helped to save your life. Yeah, I guess to, you know, to a degree. I don't know if I was going to die. I, I was definitely going to go to prison. I was definitely, because every one of my friends went to I think I think I'd like say I hung out with 20 dudes, right? Two of them I know didn't go to the joint. Well, and a couple of them are still in the joint the rest of their lives for uh, shit that put them in for deep time. And I think, you know, a guy and like I'm, you, I'm 50. They went down when they were 22. They're still in the joint. And a guy like you, you know, we talk about being game in an environment like prison. It's, I think that's a problem in surviving an environment like that is when you're naturally dispositioned to, you know, you, you, you go, you know. Um, and so I, it was dope that you joined the Coast Guard. And, and oh, it yeah, was it was dope. And then I, you came out to California. Yeah, no, I was, I was really lucky. I was lucky. I went to Hawaii first. I, was, I went to Hawaii when I, where I worked doing uh, salvage. So I got to do a lot of salvage, and I got to do a lot of liaison work with other services, and... I got to do a lot of really interesting stuff. See, what I figured was I, was, I wasn't going to the military, just going to the military. I took a look and figured out that um, I had, my family was, had, been, had been at sea forever. So we had this whole family of people that had grown up on the ocean and, and been involved in water type business. So in my mind, I kind of saw that as a potential road for me. And I figured if I could do underwater construction, then I'd be able to get a job and work in the oil fields. Because this was, this, was, this was the mid 80s that I'm doing this. And so, so you really had a plan to go the straight and narrow, more or less. Or well, I, I wanted, I want, yeah, I wanted, I figured that if I could go do something that was interesting, that made me enough money, I wouldn't have to do what I was doing. Because I was, I was, I was at high school visiting my friends in prison. We used to stop by the prison because you knew when they were in the yard and they, out, they had outside yards and we'd stop by and look and talk to them through the fence. So when, when you're, you know, exposed to that, that level of normality, for me, I was just like, is this really what I want? You know, and so I, I said, I'll go and build a new career. But I figured in my mind, I did this by the time I was 18. So most people are 18 years old. They're not thinking about building a new career. I was building a new career because the, the, the one that I left, and I didn't see any longevity in it. It, it, it. it definitely shaped my vision of the world, but I didn't see a future. So I thought if I could get into construction, underwater construction, then I'd be able to work on uh, oil fields all over the earth and have a really good career and interesting work. And I ended up getting to go through school and I went to work in the fleet and we got loaned out to do a lot of drug enforcement work to the DEA and the DOJ. So I used to get loaned out because I was single. So I didn't have a, I didn't have a wife, which kind of holds you back on mission uh, readiness. And I didn't um, have any uh, issues with diving, period. So you can send me on any mission and I'm about it. So I was a good person to loan out for work. So they could loan me out to the EOD to do military operations. I could go work with the Air Force to do uh, construction projects for them. I would go work for Army Corps. And every now and then they'd loan me out to the DEA and the DOJ to do drug interdiction. And so they would, they, you'd come to work and I'd say, hey, you got a mission? You grab your gear and you'd go down to the airport and they'd fly you to wherever this fucking shit was going on. And then they'd fly you out on a helicopter and drop you and you would do your underwater survey of the vessel and then they would come in and do the, do the scrubbing of the vessel to look for the dope. And while I was on one of those jobs, I met a bunch of dope smugglers that were huge and they never, could got, never got caught. And so I checked the vessel and there was nothing and then I'm sitting there in the vessel hanging out and the captain uh, asked me, hey, and he started talking to me and he was the captain of the vessel and they were all in the, the galley, which is the kitchen. And they weren't in trouble because there was no drugs on the boat, but they were on the raid was still going on. And, and the DEA agents are talking to him about how they've been raiding him frequently, but couldn't catch him. And so the, I knew these guys were smart and they were on a maybe 180 foot cruiser. 
like a fishing trawler, but it was scrubbed. It was beautiful and had incredible electronics on it. So where were the guys from? They were from Canada. <clears throat> so they were originally from Canada, and what they were doing is they were smuggling from Thailand into Hawaii. Was there was the movement was to go through Asia, and then they were moving that weed into the West Coast, and they would move it from atoll to atoll, and then they would jump across the open sea, and they started chopping it up with me because they said, hey, we're, we're divers too. And so we started talking and they were all really high level uh, deep water salvage guys. And they had left the military as a team. The captain and all the guys were actually, he was a captain in, 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 the, in the Navy, Canadian Navy. And all of his guys that he was with were all guys that used to work with him in the military. And they went into drug trafficking. And so he was telling me, he goes, you know, um, like we were talking about diving and I was talking about what I wanted to do and go into the oil rigs. And he was telling me that's a terrible decision and that that's not a good future. And he was like, well, what did you do before you did this? And I laughed and I said, the, the same shit you do, but just on a lot smaller level. And I said, and I just didn't, I just wanted to get the fuck out of it. And he was like, no, 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 you got to go back. He said, <coughs> he said, that's the future. And I said, no way. And he goes, yeah, it's the future. So. We talked for a while and I realized that the things that I had thought when I was young, he was confirming in this, in this boat out on the open sea. And I went back to the ship and I, and I thought about it for a while and when we got to port, when we came back on that vessel, I went and bought some botany books so I could kind of start understanding plant growth a little better. Because you started growing at a young age. Well, yeah, but I wasn't, I wasn't, the green thumb. In a formal way. No, I wasn't the green thumb, I was the brown thumb. Like, I'm, I'm someone who, who threw an incredible amount of actually doing it, got really good at it. But I wasn't a natural cultivator. I think that's why I'm a good coach, is that I had to figure it out because I wasn't. My buddy Bounce was the cultivator. So my buddy Kev really helps me understand, you know, traffic and weed. My buddy Bouncer helps me understand how to cultivate it. Why yeah. was his name Bouncer? Bouncer? Bouncy was, because um, he had like really springy feet. And so when he walked, he kind of moved up and down in the air a little bit when he walked. So it looked like he was floating. And in, in New England, man, if any, any, anybody does anything different, you get a nickname for it, you know? So, uh, oh, Bounce but we had a green thumb, though. And so Gary would, 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 we would sift the seeds out of, out of weed that we thought was awesome. And then Gary would crack the seeds. He had a sunroom on his house, in his grandmother's house, and he would crack the seeds, and then we would bring the seeds outside and grow them from there. But I was um, not the green thumb. He was the green thumb. And I realized that I should probably get an education in this. <laughs> and so I started doing some, some study in my free time, and I get to California, and I see the cannabis culture in California, and I see this whole thing unfold and I realize, whoa, cannabis in California, radically different than East Coast cannabis, where East Coast cannabis was more rough, where California cannabis was cool. And I liked it. I liked that, that there was like this just really loose, it went along with the California lifestyle. And have, have you been to Humboldt at this point? Oh, no, no. I didn't <coughs> come to Humboldt till probably, like I moved here in 92. But I got to Humboldt the first time in, let's see, I get to the Bay Area, 87, 88. In 88, I came up to Humboldt and I went and camped at Richardson Grove. I took my little brother, my, I stabbed my brother. My brother, when I left the East Coast, I had raised my little brother. So my, my, for the first like five years of my brother's life, six years, I was like his pops. And so I take off to go get my life uh, built up. But every, every vacation I had, I would have my brother fly out and stay with me. So I had my little brother stay with me for the majority of his youth, where he would come out on Christmas vacation, summer vacation. Mexico. And he went to Mexico at that time. It was a hell of a cool. But he would come with me and I would take him on all these projects that I was working on and operations and stuff. And it, it just allowed him to get out of New England and give him some uh, world travel. And it let me uh, uh, keep an eye on my brother. And when he was 12, he moved out to live uh, full time out here on the West Coast. And he's uh, still on the West Coast pretty much. He's in Nevada. but. He, you know, he was able to build himself a nice, nice life. Got a couple of beautiful kids, nice, nice woman. So, um, a fantastic athlete, you know, top ten arm wrestler in the world at, in his in his run. So that was all real positive shit. That was my first trip to Humboldt. Was it was '88? I thought it was uh, lighthouse repair. 
That was 92. I came up here to, I came up here to work in Humboldt for, to, to do a lighthouse. So in like 91, I came up to do a lighthouse in the Shelter Cove Lighthouse, the famous lighthouse here. It doesn't really exist there. It, it, was, it wasn't there. We, we relocated it from its point up on Cape Mendocino. So I came out to Humboldt to work in Cape Mendocino, which is the westernmost point of the United States. And it juts out into the ocean. And so there's a lighthouse there. But you don't need to have some of this really sophisticated lighthouse, old school design anymore because we can use modern material to make it work. So instead of just leaving it up there where it wasn't really needed and it was just gonna have to be maintained, we put in the new electronic units and then took that gorgeous lighthouse and the Fresnel lens and brought it to Shelter Cove where it was then installed and then able to be docented and, you know, which is uh, tended and then have people come and visit it. And I, I loved it up here so much, I said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm about it. As a matter of fact, the, that whole summer that I was up here working, I had Russ up here. He was probably 11. I had him up here the 92. whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, he was born 79, so he was like 13. And that's when he came up, spent the summer, went home, and then came up and lived and basically left Rhode Island. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was good, man. The, the, the Bay Area was a nice experience. California cannabis in the Bay Area was hella cool. Um, Oakland was, was, like I said, why? We're talking about Oakland, that's where I lived. So Oakland is wild, but the people were cool, and it, the herb was what was making everybody connect. And because I had a background in, i have been studying cannabis for a while now, so I had a good understanding of botany, and I had a good understanding of how to build and create, because I was doing that as a job all the time. So I was able to, uh, me and Azel hook up, I create my own indoor at my spot, and because I'm not using that as money, I'm able to play with green weed at a level that few people could where I could just freely hand it out and smoke it. And at that time, people were smoking crumbs of weed. If you weren't breaking out a joint that looked like a stick, people would be like, what is that thing? Because it was so expensive and hard to get. It wasn't everywhere. So I used this killer weed I was growing. I was getting weed out of, I was moving um, weight from Mexico east but I had connects in Mendo that I was getting some ungodly outdoor from, and I pulled the seeds out. And then I met this, this really good dude named Ralph, and he's dead now too, but uh, Ralph was a solid ass brother. And he turned me on to real California skunk that he, he was growing at his own spot, and he brought me a whole branch of it and wrapped it up in a bag and put it up on the balcony and then left a note under the door, said, look at the balcony. And I'm looking at this bag and I open it up and it's a whole branch that he had broke off so I could make clones. And so I, I, that's where I started doing my own clone work. So I, this, was, this was like, you know, uh, this would have been right, right then, 89, 90. Sit down. So I was cutting, I learned how to cut clones just to save that branch. And I started growing that nasty skunk plus this killer grass I was getting out of Mendo from this chick Sue. I used those seeds, propped those up, found something unreal. So I had two different varietals that were bo ballistically good. And I was running them all in Rockwell slabs. And then I, I shifted into um, bio base with you know, heavy worm casts and stuff. But the, the hydro at the time was what everyone, remember you're talking 90. So it, it was you know, a different you know, uh, technology in the grow game was just coming on and you were able to produce. I didn't really get the appreciation for good outdoor until I came to basically Humboldt, where when I started smoking really good outdoor pot that was um, well done, cured right, stable, it blew my mind at how rich it was. But that, that rock wool slab strains from that time on that indoor were killing it. And so I could go to all these parties, all these killer Bay Area parties, and I could, I could whip, whip out nasty weed and just release joints of it to smoke so that I could hang out. And what it did is it let me meet all these people in the Bay that were heavy into the game and they were like, whoa, that's good grass. And you obviously must have more grass because you're just throwing it around. So what it did is it let me meet a bunch of people and it let me tie into like the whole Bay Area scene of like what's cool. And it helped me understand California. So then, you know, you, you get to see what's popping in Frisco and what's popping in, in the East Bay. And it kind of helps you understand people and California dynamics. Because I'm East Coast, and so there's subtleties you have to pick up. 
and I, I, I used that good grass to open up these doors so that I could en enjoy the company and then people were able to meet me too because it kind of creates a common bond and it just let me have uh, connections to friends that I still have today. It's and good, man. <laughs> One of the first parties I remember, I was coming up here. I mean, first we were hooking up through Nicole, mm -hmm. and then uh, Nicole was out of the picture because uh, of Smarly Dogger for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one of the first parties, man, we had spent the night. It might have been Shelter Cove or Honeydew or Petrolia, but it was a Latino dude with a, like a maroon lowrider, and he was he had oh, everybody yeah, spend the night. Ronnie. Ronnie, yeah, 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 yeah. And it was a beautiful party, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this, this place was ripping back then. The lifestyle in Humboldt was phenomenal because people that were relatively normal were making ungodly sums of money. And regular people, when they have money, they're, they're freer with it. The, the part of being wealthy is you know how to retain it. And people that are uh, not coached to be wealthy spend more of it. But because they spend more of it, in a lot of ways, it really trickles down to the population around them at a grunge grade. If there was a, such a thing as trickle down economics, it would be that people that like pot growers were getting paid because everybody around them is making money. Every store owner makes more money. Everybody gets a tip. Everybody gets a little extra work. The people who work for you get paid better than normal. House cleaners. Everybody. The money, money goes through everybody's hands. But it doesn't seem to move that way from wealthy down as much as people would like to think it does. And so, you know, everybody was doing well here. You didn't have to lock your doors. You didn't have to, you didn't have to worry about shit in your truck. You didn't have to worry about a damn thing. Nobody wanted to rob you or steal. Like people were getting robbed in dope deals, but you were your neighbors were definitely not stealing from you. It, no one, no one needed to steal from you. They probably had more shit than you did, and it allowed you to, you know, have this really, really cool, graceful life. And because the money was wild and the lifestyle was risky, people really partied and celebrated and traveled and explored their lives. They were kind of like Azel, where they're going to do the damn thing. If they're going to go get into motorcycles, they're going to go race them. If they're gonna, they're gonna learn how to fly a plane, they wanna learn how to fly a jet. So it was wild to see so many people explore the limits of their lives. You know, and whether it was good or bad, whether, whether you agreed or not, people had the funds and the time to really find out where the edges of their reality touch, you know? Reminds me of Gabe. Yeah, Jackson. yeah. So I got, a, I got a, a text in my pocket too. I just was looking through. You still kept it? Which, uh, yeah, well, I found it in. I was going through my phone, and I pulled up a text from 2012, and it was Big Gabe, right? And me and him were chatting about something, and I laughed because I, I was like, whoa. So I took a screenshot of it and kept it. But he's just a really good example of the kids from here where he had come from a family that um, was hustling and hustling hard, and he comes into a time period where the money's big, and he was raised to be bold, and he was a gifted kid, uh, period. And he just blew up. And I mean, blew the fuck up. And so most people aren't, you know, multimillionaires when they're still 16 years old. You're 17 and you're making a couple hundred grand a month in, in paper, straight, and you're keeping it. Like, people don't catch it. Like, businesses make that much money, people don't spend that much money. And so Gabe was just going off, but he was a phenomenal driver. And so he was into racing all, all vehicles, when he, when he wanted to go study, you know, some Muay Thai, he went over to Thailand for six months. And so I had a bunch of friends that went over to Brazil and studied uh, BJJ through the, the gyms in Brazil. And they came back and they were good grapplers, man. Like, the humble boys and girls really, really push the limits of their lives. And there's a price to pay when you push the limit. When you fall over the side, you die. And Gabe ended up getting killed in a, a, a really fucked up way. But we had a good friendship and... I still miss him. I still miss him. <laughs> As you see the story, a lot of people are dead. Um, that's, that's really the game. And this was uh, 15 years ago, right? Something like that? Uh, well, Gabe passed like... away about three or four years ago. Gabe, it's been more than that. No, nah, I was at the shop, so it, 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 four years. The boys ain't here right now, but probably four years ago. Could have been more than four years ago. Gabe Jackson? Yeah, yeah. He, he went about four years ago. Okay, damn. Okay, I'm tripping. Yes, yeah. I think I said. Yeah, I you're think right. His, you're right. His I'm, son, tripping. I'm tripping. Because his um his uh his his uh baby's probably you know around five no more can't be more than six, tops. And he had already she had already been pregnant. She already had the baby, and the baby was already a certain age. 
It so, feels like much longer, but I think you're well, right. you, well, you're getting you're getting older too, and like is you get older, and all of a sudden time just kind of becomes this long continuum, this pipe of forever. And when people when people pass away, especially if they're close to you, for the first so many months they're in your mind constantly, and then all of a sudden you you realize that you didn't think about them for a minute, and then all of a sudden you realize you didn't think about them for a couple of days. And then you didn't think about them for a whole month because they, didn't, they weren't popped in your conscious because it's almost like you thought it so much that you put it away on a shelf. And that's, I think, your, your brain protecting you from sorrow. So all the people that you love in your life that uh, die prematurely, you, you have to kind of cope with in some capacity. And I think that you know, when you lose people in your life, you think it's so heavy, then you put it to sleep. And then you kind of lose track of when was it, you know? And what I was thinking when I was uh, thinking about Gabe is uh, Humboldt has changed incredibly um, the past 10, 15 years. And uh, from now until then, the quality of life for many locals has changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, and how would you describe um, the biggest external pressures um, that Humboldt has to overcome in order to survive this next uh, stage of the game? You know, I, the external pressure isn't what really fucked Humboldt up. What, what fucked Humboldt up was that Humboldt, because it's so unbelievably beautiful, it's just so unbelievably gorgeous, you have a really, really powerful ecological support here. And ecological support in, in, in terms that we can understand, or we call legal terms of uh, they'll sue you if you violate environmental stuff, right? So it's a good thing. These individuals that protect the redwoods from being cut down, they keep, they keep the rivers from being flooded up. They're the environmentalists that fight for the, the right to keep humble, humble. That privilege to live in a beautiful place like this causes incredible pressure on people to get permits that are environmentally approved. And so what happens is the, the farmers at Humboldt that had all these spots up in these places that were not really causing a lot of problems, in order to get it legal, you had to rebuild the road. And the road standards changed and, and the, where the water could be drawn changed. And they changed to these very extremely expensive, hard to get options. And so the people in Humboldt could have moved forward but the place itself, in order to keep it beautiful, you have to have this incredible environmental control. And it, it made it to where they couldn't afford it. And so I see people talking like some real shit about them too, like they weren't prepared. And they were like, no, they were really prepared and really qualified. But you didn't just get to walk onto some flat ground in the, in the high desert and throw up your concrete. You had to do huge environmental impact reports. You had to do an unbelievable, it's, it's more, it's, if you can get the, the Humboldt license, the state license is relatively easy because we're by far the most restrictive environmentally in the whole state. So those things that make Humboldt beautiful caused issues for the farmers. And, and that's why so many of them tried so hard to go forward because they wanted to live and be here too. They wanted to, they, shit, they built it. I, I, I'm only, I've only been here, I've been here over half my life, but I'm only a 92er, you know? So, people's families have been here so to them this was big and the, the environmental stuff is what got them I you know I feel like the interview is going in a, in a somber direction and, and that's okay but I also you know want to reflect on uh, the many years of experience that we have already in our belt and I was sharing with, with Sean a story mm -hmm. of uh, I think it was maybe you know 15 20 years ago and you were you were talking about uh, there was a nutrient at the time where everybody's hands would be turned would turn blue oh yeah yeah grow ball. And I believe that's when you met a gentleman who had a, a beat up truck. He never got a brand new rig, never got anything flossy. And I remember uh, you guys started working together and he ended up having one of the most impressive homes that you've ever been to. Yeah, I went to his house the next day f to do we buy some pounds. So we, we, his name was Ray. I still remember this dude. That was back in the day when we, we, you, were, you were using all this, it was funny baby, you were using Grow More and Plantex and because it has a trace dye in it, you were using those 105210s and stuff to boost uh, during floor production, right? And you'd go to the club at night or you go to the bar and, and you could always tell everybody that was in the game because they had blue dye stuck in their nails because it would stain your cuticle. 
it would get on your fingers. Even if you washed it off, you'd have this blue tinge. And under the lights in a nightclub, you could see the blue light. So you'd look and you'd see all the people that had the blue light. But I met Ray in, in, a, in a bar and he was hammered and he looked like he was homeless. And we were sitting there, I mean, like straight up homeless. And he went out to a, a vehicle that was like tied together with baling wire. And I was just cracking up and I'm hanging out with this guy and I have no idea who he is and we're just chopping it up. And I'm cracking up because he's funny and he's a solid dude and I don't judge you off of what you look like or your money. So like, I, can, I can actually hang out with you if you're cool and that's all you gotta be. And he looked as poor as it could be. And the next day when we went out up to, up to the hill to go and do the business, we went up to this house that looked like it came out of a Japanese film, man, where, I mean, it was some stunning architecture. It was all native hardwoods and he had huge bunkers in the ground filled with all kinds of vehicles. It was, it was just an unbelievable vision of country mountain weed grower wealth. And we walk into the house and he comes walking around the corner, except he was clean and, and sober. And I was like, I said, what the fuck are you doing here? And he's like, this is my house. And I started laughing and he was telling me about how him and all his buddies used to have competitions over who could look the ugliest and drive the worst shit so that nobody would recognize that they had money in town. And that was before the era of bling. See, you remember the era of bling because it was, was, was spinners. I grew up It was it. the ropes. It was pimp my ride. It was everything that you had to do to let everybody see your exterior but you were still living at your mom's house, basically. And I mean, for real, cats were wearing more on their body than they had in the bank. And that was America. And in 2007, when the, the economy zenith, by 2008, that ended. And now you're in a reality economy. But that wild economy where everybody was just showing it, that's when Humboldt changed, too. That's when everybody started having the gross displays of wealth in Humboldt County, too. But I met, I met Ray in you know, 93. And so 90, no, 90, and it would have been, been 95. I met Ray in 95 because my son, 94, he, she was my, the baby's mama was pregnant. And so I'm up here chilling with my buddy Brian. My buddy Brian's family was balling up here. So I meet this dude on the road on some motorcycles. We bump into each other, we become friends. Well, this cat's a lunatic. And he's old school family from here. And so I remember driving around for hours in a Jeep, just drifting. And I'm like, where are we at? And he goes, we're still in my family's property. They had massive acreage in the mountains. It was old timber family. And they had, they had broke it all up into 80s, but every family member in the whole family had an 80 acre piece connected into this massive mega parcel. So you know, like a thousand acres. And I was tripping out because I had never seen space like that before. And so this dude, Brian, I mean, we're still friends. We, we still hang out now. Um, he introduced me to all the locals and, and it was wild because it was a really close knit situation then because camp happened just you know nine years uh, ten years earlier 83 84 this is nine you know 94 so the the prices had zenith up into the you know five grand range the the DEA and the cops were busting down left and right camp was pounding and everybody was nervous and so new people were tough to meet but through Brian I got to meet all these individuals and I got to meet tons of them just hanging out, uh, chilling. And it let me see, you know, that era of Humboldt in a really nice way. I would have been like, you know, 27. And I got to see just the old Humboldt that had made the transition from when pounds were less to when pounds blew up to where all the old families had become wealthy. And it was almost like an elegance. And, and then the, the, the bling era comes in and it kind of got perverted where the money became everything, not the lifestyle with the money. And, can, and the quality of the cannabis diminished. People started really, uh, uh, you could just move weed. And then, and then all of a sudden you started having a renaissance probably like 2002, 2003, when the DA changed the, the rules here about plant count and they said 99 is basically acceptable. Well, that's when the people in Humboldt said, well, if 99 is acceptable, then let's do 99 outside on an acre and, and get 1,400 pounds. And they were. And so that's what changed. It was where it went back to outdoor and all the people that were doing outdoor started to realize that the old timers that had talked about the organic methodologies were correct. That it really is the only way to drive these plants healthily in this big fashion. And you started to see this resurrection of the organic cultivation movement. And because there was little persecution at that time, relatively speaking, a lot of people got into growing. 
and you started to see like this different kind of community because the risk was less. And so the, the, the world I was from was not from that kind of time. It was based off of a rougher world. And this was a more communal, happy cannabis world, which I really thought was nice. It was a beautiful transition. But it just got a lot of people to believe that um, growing weed was going to be something they were going to do the rest of their life, making easy money, just chilling. And they didn't realize that each evolution that made it easy for the next person to come in would eventually wipe everyone out. And this is pretty much more or less where we're at today. That's where we're at right now. And it's, it, it's, it's a tough one because you have, right now you're sitting, like right now you're sitting in literally in the, in the literal epicenter of the dope growing kingdom where Salmon Creek is right behind you, Miranda's on our backside. You go uh, uh, like 13 miles that way, you're in Honeydew, you go out there, you're in Edinburgh, you're in... You're in the whole your River Valley section here. This is where all the weed at one point in time was just filling America. And right now it's still, so it had the largest number of identified illegal grows in California when they did all the waterboard testing, or you know, the satellite work. And then right now it's got the largest number of permits in California is right here. So Santa Barbara's got more acreage by a little bit, but we have by far more people participating and this is where they're doing it. So we're standing here right in the, you know, the, the, the center of this spot. And it, it's just, you know, Humboldt has an ability down the road to be able to work when you open the borders. California system screwed up, but once the borders open up, the quality of the cannabis that's here is really excellent. And you're, you, you, you have a problem seeing the qualities because for so many years, the good shit moved as indoor out of the area. And now the way small farms get their product through the supply chain, by the time the, the end user gets it, it might be t 10, 11 months old. So it's hard to move 10 month old weed and compare it to two month old weed and talk about similar. It's, it's, there's, especially if they're not holding it in climate controlled spaces. So the, the problem that the humble farmers have and any of the craft farmers have, small farmers, and craft meaning like say, you know, acre and below and hopefully organically derived. And if I'm putting the word craft on it, it's gotta be organically derived. But something that's in a, in a reasonable range of size and you're using the environment to create the quality. So it's, it's a huge impact. It's your, it's your phenotypical response on the genotype. The, the quality here is supernatural, but you have to be able to get it into an appreciation market globally. And I think that that's what needs to happen here. And it will, because you're gonna start opening those borders. And so the sad part is that Humboldt will definitely be okay in the future. It's just that so many of the people that were here from the past won't be here as growers to take part. The, the property will be here, the permits will be here, new players will be here. But a lot of the older ones, man, they just couldn't handle the course. Brutal. Uh is there cultural wealth here, and if so, how? Oh, fuck this cultural wealth here. This is, Humboldt County is, and like I said, I didn't come here for the grass. I was, I was already in the hustle. I, I knew about Humboldt County. I, I, that th this is where, you know, people had, people had produced the weed. Well, I get here and what I learned is that this is where people had learned how to live with cannabis that they allowed cannabis to fund their lives and build community centers and create daycares and help neighbors who were struggling. It allowed them to be able to uh, have time to work on the land and create beautiful gardens. And Humboldt is where to me, you have like the birth of organic culture. I mean, and what does organic culture mean? Culture of people who wanna consume organic bottled food, organic cannabis. It really came out of here. This is this, and this was the hippies. That's why you know, the 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 preservation of the environment here is every bit as important as the preservation of the people. Because if you if you just logged it out and cleaned it up, it'd be no different than anywhere else in California. But instead, it's not. It's got the best air quality in America. We got incredible water quality. You can't deny it. You can't deny that the impact on the cannabis here is phenomenal, and. It, it had an incredible impact on the people because the region is so rough and tough in the winter and hot and dry and fire that the communities have to work together. And so what I got to learn here was what a mountain communities bond and how cannabis connected so many dissimilar people and dissimilar races and tremendous diversity up here. It's crazy. I, I, 
I lived in the Bay Area, but I didn't really have that many gay friends in the Bay Area, which you think I did. I would have, you think I have more. I get to Humboldt, and I mean, and through through the cannabis thing, I, I just meet an unbelievable amount of gay people in general, and the, the the way they're woven in the community, it was like a normality and no stigma. And then I got all these friends that are from different uh, races, nationalities, countries up here that have been working for a while, and it's the same thing. Basically, as long as you're cool, you can live here, and I love that. And so like, that's what Humboldt brings, is that Humboldt forces people to bow down a little bit because you're not bigger than Humboldt. You're not bigger than the weather. You're not bigger than the, 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 the region. And, neither, and cannabis isn't bigger than Humboldt either. Humboldt, Humboldt's gonna be here because it's a continental, it's the westernmost point of the continental shelf. It sticks out into the ocean. It's, it's been like this for a long time. And it bends the people, it makes the people have to work with it. And I think that that was a huge Im impact on the way they grew and, and how they grew up as a group. And, and hopefully what we can do is have people come from other parts of the world to now explore Humboldt because they don't have to worry about the secrecy of cannabis cultivation anymore. And you'll be able to get people to come up in the hills and actually meet the locals. And Humboldt has the highest amount of artists per um, capita of anywhere in the United States. So this is an artisanal population that's unbelievable because everybody was able to explore all their skills. And so, I mean, I know people who do all the stunning artwork and ceramics and glass work and woodwork and metal sculpting and wood turning and clay and ceramic and, and fabric. And I mean, like, wow, painters, it's just mind bending, you know, like that's, that's culture to me, man. That's all the things that make people people, the things that you, you, you create and share. And so in my mind, tourism will be attracted to that. Mm-hmm. Because tourists, if typically, you know, when you leave where you're at, you want something different. But you'd also like to see things that reaffirmed your life, too. So if you like a nice life and you have good connections with your family and your friends and you go to another country and you get to go and hang out with those people in those countries and they're friendly and they're nice and they introduce you to their family and friends and you are able to share in the normality of being human beings, you have a good time. And if you're doing that here, I mean, this is one of the most beautiful places in the world. This couldn't be any, any, any prettier. So if, if humble is something that needs to be worked with or dealt with, so to speak, the, the rugged terrain, um, does corporate cannabis really have uh, challenges ahead of them? Uh, because I know for the most part they're having their way and they're kind of eating each other up um, what do you feel is one of the biggest challenges, if any, for, for corporate cannabis in our space? They don't have any challenges. They don't, they don't have any real challenges because what they're going to do is they're going to they're gonna run through money until they sort it out. Because t look at every other industry in the world. Uh, every other industry is run by large groups. They run through the money until they work it out. What they, what they have, you have options here, I think, as a cultivator where if you can keep your farm here, you'd be able to have high-level product leave here over time. And I think for a lot of the corporate entities, they'll pick up pieces of Humboldt to have as their, their sun-grown high-level component as a diversity product. So they'll be like, you know, Mondavi, where they sell the, the premium Mondavi, and then there's like the lower Mondavi. Lower Mondavi is big field grown, and their upper, upper Mondavi is a perception of quality because it's got a little better, a little better impact. That could be this. And I think our community has many misperceptions of the realities and the truths of our industry. And does the, is there a certain truth that um, you think our our community needs to know about? You know, do not get this certain thing misunderstood about what's coming, the future of our industry. Yeah, I, I think that the part that's hard is that. For a lot of people, you connect what you do as you. This is who I am. And that's not true. It's, it's what you're doing. You're you. If I, if I moved you to another planet where you didn't do this, would you just wither and die? Or would you go and do something? You would do something. It's you. It's you that, that is the component. And you have to be able to kind of separate that stuff because otherwise anytime there's a shift that makes you feel minimized, it emotionally beats you to death. And what you have to realize with cannabis is that we had a really good run. We had a great run. We had, you know, 50, 60 years of, you know, from like, you know, mid 60s forward of incredible prosperity. 
And anybody who lived during that time and was able to benefit from it did really well. And now it's been changed into normal business, just what it is. So if we were all craft furniture makers, all of a sudden, you know, the big furniture factory comes in. And what they identify is that most people just would rather have cheaper furniture because it's not important to them. The cultural mores of uh, what we do and don't do, cultural desires of what we want and what we don't want, all shape those perceptions. And because of that, you have to understand that you're in an industry now. You're no longer in what you were in and you just have to realize that the desire for this global tri over the next you know 20 years was going to be trillion dollars be 40 where they figure 40 billion by in, in, in a couple of years 2024 40 billion global so just give it a second and let it light up maybe trillions a little excessive but I, i've seen that number thrown out but just let's say it's a couple hundred billion dollar industry you don't think people want in on that and the ones that do they have the ability to move and i think that you just have to realize that you hold the craft you, you, don't, you, you can have six plants legally in California. Those people that grow those six, if there's many of you that uh, are doing so, you're the craft, you're the culture of the old because you're able to cultivate without any kind of um, uh, prejudice. So you're allowed to grow your own weed. You can grow it without fear of being put in trouble. So it allows you to start having many people growing good grass. You can access stunning genetic material. You can cultivate it yourself. It allows you to still be a pot grower. It still allows you to, to you know, enjoy weed freely like we did because only us that grew weed could smoke weed at the rate we smoked it because regular people can't afford to smoke that much. So you're not smoking a goddamn ounce a day when you're having to buy that shit. But when you're growing it, you sure are. And so, so much of our culture was based off of this incredible relationship of abundance with weed. You can still do that if you're producing your own grass. And I think that that's what people have to like put the emotions there to where you, 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 you make sure you love, you love weed so much or do you like making money off of weed? Because you have to make sure you're clear about it. Because if it's making money off of weed, don't cry that there's bigger businesses coming because they're in every other field you're in. Mm -hmm. Name something that doesn't have a big animal in it. All right, well, they're, they're all there. And in that regard, it's yeah. going to bring me great pleasure, pleasure to see some members of our community, some people that uh, we know even, that will see success in the cannabis space. Oh, yeah. We're no. not all going to fail. No, no, no. We're not all going to fail. But, 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 but honestly. The best of the best. It, yeah, well, kind of. Best of the best is a tough one because best of the best meaning what? You really need to say the best of the best meaning the people who know how to get the funding and are able to get market share. It doesn't, the best cultivator doesn't necessarily mean they're going to exist. Good that's point. Not, it, Good it's point. Not, that's not how it works because you know many, many best people, but they're not killing it in any other industry. Every now and then, but a lot of times it's really, you know, who you know and your position. And so this is the same as that too. That's why it's kind of tricky. The, the, the thing is you got to put yourself in situations where you're very clearly defining who you're going to be and your position. And to me, you're either Coca-Cola or you're a micro soda. The beer model works, but the problem with the beer model is, is that almost every craft beer is owned by a conglomerate now. So when you go in there and you see all the craft beer, you're like, they're all craft breweries. 90% of them are owned by monstrous companies. So they used to be a craft brewery, but they got acquired because that's why they built the business. And so that you don't have such a proliferation of small companies. The U.S. specifically doesn't like small companies. They like large corporate models because it's easier to regulate. This will be no different. You, you, you have to be business smart. And you have to be business smart in, in a sense of how do you project what's going to happen in an industry that there's no map to follow. That's tough. And even though there's no map to follow... You're still looking at a map and being like, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be in Colombia. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be in Israel. Totally. But I'm, I'm, I'm creating that map, but Correct. it doesn't, but it, it, there's no book for me to follow. What I'm doing is I'm just being highly proactive. See, if, and, and a lot of it too is that I, I want to see the world unfold because it helps me understand the world I'm in. So the more information that I can gather firsthand, the more projects I'm involved in, the more consultant I do and all these different things that I'm involved in as a consultant, it just helps me understand better the pieces as a whole. And we didn't have to do this before. See, my desire wasn't really to go this hard. 
It was really to, to be a good cultivator, produce really good organic grass, and have a life. But when I, I had the revelation that this world was gonna transform, I was like, I do not wanna get caught in the meat grinder that's going, we're all gonna get dumped into down the road. And so I, I try to take a look at as much as I can all the time. I try to form alliances with companies that are doing stuff well above my level so that I can understand from their perspective what it is they do, how they do it. And then I can understand how that's gonna get used against me by other companies because it's just the tools used. And so I'm creating a map to move, but really I'm moving on instinct. And I don't know if it's right or wrong either because we haven't finished the story. Can you share with us what you're seeing in Colombia and Israel? And I, I don't think, I think you're in a unique position in that there's consultants and there's people who take phone calls, but who's really touching down around the world and seeing things firsthand and talking to people firsthand? The major companies are, the monsters are. I'm, I'm lucky that I get requested to come out. So I get, I get requested to come out and look at projects globally. And it's, it's incredible because they're, they're doing some really beautiful work too. It, it, it reaffirms what I believe that California produces some of the best grass on the planet. But the culture's a killer. The, the people are good people. They want to succeed. The companies that are trying to create modern business in these places are trying to succeed. And it's nice to be able to be in my position because you're, you're actually on the ground floor of an industry. So it kind of lets you take a look at all the mistakes we made and figure out how do we not make them there. And you just try to make the best from the experiences. And what I really like about it is that no matter where I go, cannabis people are cool. And they have a common desire. The, they would like to be able to farm weed and make money. They would like to be able to, and companies want to breed weed and make money. And companies want to extract weed and make money. And distributors want to uh, move weed and make money. So everybody wants to work with weed and they want to make money which is no shaming because that's what you're in business for. But I would say, you know, the, the vast majority of people that I meet are really cool. So it's nice to see, like, we do, everybody talk about the, the collapse of the cannabis culture. Cannabis does the work, man. You're not doing it. Cannabis creates that, that bond around it, and the people who consume it are all pretty chill. And, and I, I like it. And I like getting out of the country and seeing how other operations work. And I like to go to countries that are struggling so that you get a better appreciation of how just damn good you have it. And you can see how hard people work for so little and how they still maintain their dreams. And they, they accept the fact that the game is tough and that there's no easy run. And so it always helps you be, be way, way more humble about your circumstances. And you know, traveling the world's never bad. I know you went to Russia, that was for Bellin. Uh, Canada, mm -hmm. Colombia, Israel. Oh, you mean for, like, for cannabis related stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't do, I didn't do cannabis related stuff in Russia, but cannabis related stuff, uh, all North America, and then America, and then South America, Middle East, and that's it so far. And that's, and that's, and. It's not bad? No, it's not bad, that's all cannabis related. I mean, for me traveling around the world, I've been all over the place, you know, on travels, but that's vacation and then and then athletic related stuff so they're different but for cannabis related stuff um it's it's been really interesting and, and around, around the u.s i got to go around a lot of the u.s states and i i talked to a lot of people in other states that hit me up just trying to understand how do we begin an operation and it, it allows you to be able to you know basically if the people are cool if they're polite um i'll, I'll try to answer your question and, and a lot of it is because you'd like to see people that are on these uh, lower financial levels where they're not mega conglomerates at least begin the process. What cannabis cultures across the country have impressed you over the years? You've talked about the boys in uh, maybe Tennessee, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's uh, Arkansas. Or... They're, I, they're, I'm all impressed with all of them because what, what, I really, what I really know is that cannabis connects people. So any place where people love to smoke weed, they always want to show you their good weed. They always want to smoke with you their good weed. They always want to share in the story of how they got the weed. They want you to be able to feel their passion. And that's, that doesn't make a difference where I go in the world, no matter what state, what place. People who love weed, love weed, and they want you to be able to enjoy it with them. 
and I think that, that, that there's like no competition on that. Like Humboldt has something different in that it's got this massive concentration of people in America that are about it. And America was super anti-drug. And we, we consume all the drugs, but we, you know, we're draconian on the prosecution. So it have this, this little enclave here where everybody was just going Drug off. War. And, and Humboldt was producing. We were doing over eight billion, at our zenith, we were doing eight billion a year. So, you know, we're, we're, doing, we're doing the whole U.S. legal economy right now in cannabis out of Humboldt County. So, you know, that was measuring the velocity of money moving through the banks, moving that much truck. This was the only place in California you had a truck money out of. So Humboldt was doing an ungodly amount of business. It, it, it monetized the region. But that's what made Humboldt different, is that it monetized it. But the rest of the place is just like Humboldt loved weed. So no matter where I go, the culture's all really the same. They really enjoy smoking. They really like to smoke with you. They would love to be able to talk about um, how to grow better weed, how to, how to understand weed better. I mean, it's just unbelievable, man. It's, I, I thought there was gonna be all these differences, you know, in, in how we approach it. But the tr truth is, is that herb is herb. And she's doing the work. She basically gets people to find a common ground. And so would you say that there is a financial or economic opportunity by uh, weaponizing our culture as we would weaponize another skill set? Um, what do you mean by weaponize? We uh, weaponize, I say weaponize because it's such a dire uh, situation. You mean like empower? Yeah, empower, use it as a tool. I, you know, the whole thing with cannabis culture was it was chill. It was, it was never, let's all get together and go, let's go smoke and then let's go do, you know, political shit. It was, let's go smoke and let's go enjoy our lives. You know, I, I want to go smoke and listen to music. I want to smoke and hang with my chick. I, I, I want to smoke and I, I want to be able to go out to the woods so that I can slow down mentally and see the trees. My girl wants to smoke, so she'll hit me with a frying pan. But tourism will be a cash injection into the economy, you think? Not, not through the cultural pot, like they'll market to it, but for the, a lot of people coming in, you know, what, what, what they want to be able to do is just enjoy pot and they have little memories of it maybe when they were younger and then they quit smoking for a long time for a lot of people. Because you gotta remember the biggest, you know, people coming in is these older groups. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what they would like to be able to do is just get access to some good clean weed of varieties and, and choices to suit their needs. And if it satisfies them and makes them happy and relaxes them, then what we start to see is, you know, this cool type of situation where like, you know, hangouts, places where dissimilar can get together and enjoy weed together. And all of a sudden you start having community building, kind of like pubs in Europe, where the pub was like the little spot that the, the neighborhood would go to to all have a, a pint. And some people have 10, but some of them would have one. And you get to talk to your neighbors for a sec and just form some bonds so that you weren't strangers to each other. Social consumption. Yeah, and then you go home. Stuff like that, you know, but trying to empower people that direction, it just doesn't work. You don't see much of it anywhere else in anything else. What you see is money-driven direction. And I think that that's why I always stress on the, you know, the personal cultivation where, you know, like for me, what I wanted to have people do is, I, I, I have no doubt that the monsters were coming. So I said, look, what you do is you give you power people with genetics, you provide all this killer material to all these regular people. So I pushed more plants than anybody I know into the game. And, I, and, and I gave it, and even before Wonderland, for years I was moving stock. And I let a lot of regular people get their hands on some really irregular plants because I wanted people to be able to have access to be able to enjoy it and use it. That was if one you, of them. If you're making money on it right now, that's great. And if you were smoking it because you consume it even better because that means it's stuff that you don't have to buy. You have a couple plants you can hold, you keep a single mom, you grow five bushes out in your yard, you got enough grass to last you a year easy. For the average smoker, that's the, the point to me is to tie that in that you, you get the ability to have control of your smoke so that it's not financially driven and you're not financially limited on how much you can consume. Now you can go share a bag with your friend because you're legally allowed to give an ounce away. So when someone comes over, you're like, here, here's, here's a quarter ounce of some kill, man, and go enjoy it. That to me was the old cool cannabis part that I liked. That's what I really dug. The business was cool too because it's how we make the money, but when you talk about cultural stuff, what I liked was that people that were into weed were pretty nice and you'd share pot, you'd share material. You know, that's, that's, that's the part that I, I'm in. And there's a term out here you guys uh, use, and I use, I like to use it now, is, is legend. Oh, you know, that was legend. Uh, when we talk about your experience, your time here in, in Humboldt, 
Uh, are there any any characters that in your mind were legend to you and how they ran their operation and in the guts that they had, the resolve they had? You know, there was monsters here, real ones, and, and, and some of them got away, but a lot of these big fish got caught and caught fed time. And they were really organized and sophisticated and on a, on a big push level, they were impressive. But you know what really impressed me, man, more than anything was, was the old, as, as I look back over time, was that the, 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 the old timers that did, you know, beautiful organic culture and really, really took their time cultivating the small crops that they were cropping. That's the legend. The, the flower was unbelievable. It was so good. And it wasn't homogenous like it is today, where everybody's running the same exact material. So whatever's trendy, everybody's pushing the same crap. There was a diversity that was unbelievable, and people were able to grow what they liked most, and they would grow it every year. But they would grow it the, the, the best way they possibly knew how. And that, that's the real legend. All the other stuff is just cash and technical. So like, and, and nothing impresses me anymore. Like, I mean, I, you know, I, we were, there was dudes here that had thousand light illegal operations. So like, you're running a thousand lights, man, that's no joke. Um, that's bigger than a lot of the modern legal operations. So some of the guys here were massive and I would put clone operations into people that were colossal. So it was impressive, but not compared to what I'm looking at nowadays with, with nursery operations. Like no nursery operation of Humboldt's heyday ever touched any of the new ones coming out of Southern Cal. And it's not the scope. The, the, the production was, but not the nursery ops. And it, so I look at it and I go, I got you, everything has been surpassed, but the quality from those heyday times has never been surpassed. That's the legend that the people who were growing using these inputs and doing all the work that was required to really make the plant shine, they were creating a, a product that was so good that it, it inspired me to chase it my whole life. So like, I didn't really copy anybody that was balling because I was always copying commercial ag anyways in terms of concepts because we, why start out looking in the closet? You might as well go look at the building. And the building gives you a better idea what's inside it, not necessarily the closet. And so I would look at it from a big picture down view on anything I did. And that, that stuff, um, I was inspired by the people who did the real work and that's why I'm still here. You said the word building. Uh, do you feel comfortable sharing the story of, I think you were scaling a building to meet up with Mark Emery? I think it was in Canada, maybe? Oh, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. I, that was funny, man. Uh, what year was he, it got, he got popped. That would have been like, Emery got popped in like, I think, 96, right? So my, I fly down to Canada to go meet Mark Emery, and the day before I get there, he gets grabbed. And I'm there to do a big seed deal, and I'm like, fuck. So I go to... Um, this shop that was his cannabis shop and I talked to this girl who was working at the counter and her name is Hillary Black and she's this huge Can Canadian activist right now like she's like big in Canada but I met her when she was a kid working at the counter of Mark Emery's store and we talked for a while and I had my own weed with me I had brought my own weed with me to Canada because I was afraid I wouldn't be able to score any grass which is funny because it was everywhere, but I, I, was, I was a heavy smoker and I'm like, well, so, but I brought me some really greasy shit. And she was laughing when she was talking to me because she said, there's no way you're a cop. And so she gave me a business card to a, a, another store. I went to that store with the business card, handed them the card. They handed me another card and it was an address in a skyscraper in downtown Vancouver. And I went into the place and I went up the stairs and it was like on like the 10th floor, you know, 11th floor. And I look at the door and I'm like, this is a setup. The feds grabbed them. I'm going to get trapped in here. I'm screwed. So I went up a couple flights and I went out the window onto a fire escape. But this was Canada. It wasn't like the U.S. This was like an aluminum ladder chained to the outside of a building. So I'm like 150 foot off the ground climbing down this fucking ladder chained to the side of a building. And I'm hanging off of it, looking in the window to make sure that they didn't have a, a, a team in there to grab me. And I climb back up and then I go into the office, you know, and oh, it's better nowadays. You know what I mean? Jesus, the stuff we had to do before was crazy. It was crazy. There was never endingly running for your life, fleeing in cars, running through the hills with bad, you know what I mean? The raids. Ah. <laughs> ah. And you know, that's, that's the same feeling that I had that, ah, uh, you know, because uh, being in regulated cannabis presents a whole nother set of real challenges, but at least you're not having to run for your life. Oh, totally. The, 
if, if you're young and you, you like excitement, that's cool. And if you're old and you like excitement, that's cool. But the problem is there's no stability with any of that. And once you start having kids, once you start having grandkids, like that kind of shit, um, you need to stabilize or otherwise you find yourself draining your family of all their money in legal fees. And then they have to go visit grandpa in the joint. So <laughs> it, it's just not the best thing, you know what I mean? <clears throat> and and so I don't, I don't miss some of the stuff we had to do. I, I miss the way people behaved because of, people were a lot more discreet. And you, you, were, you were just a little cooler about it in general. So there was, there was just a, a, people behaved a little better. Everybody was afraid of getting ratted out, so you didn't really, you were cautious on how you shit on other people. And nowadays, nobody cares about anything, so you're, you're, nothing's, nothing's not thrown out in public. And being able to have uh, like some privacy in life was kind of nice. This was all before the internet, really, you know? The, the old game was uh, more of a gentleman's game because we all had much higher risk. Once the risk was real, everybody pays more. So you're cautious. You don't want to get in trouble and you don't want to get anybody else in trouble. But as the risk decreases, then, you know, the, the punishment decreases. So those times kind of shaped us in how we behaved. And I kind of like that part of it. And every now and then, you know, you love telling the story of, you know, running. I, was, I mean, I ran through this building and jumped from one building to another building with an entire trash bag of weed. And it was in, in a raid. Yeah, in California over in, um, what's right out? El Cerrito. So I was in this spot in El Cerrito, and the spot gets hit. And I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. And so I, I, I had been looking out this porch balcony for a while and I, I was thinking that I could jump from that balcony all the way to this other balcony on the building next to us. In my mind I believed I could and it was just a thought and a raid goes down at this house and I go flying through the house and I yell to the owner's wife to open the door and she opens the door they throw me all the weed and I jump from one building to another building through the air and land on the deck of another building, another balcony. The fuck? And, and I cover myself with the trash and I didn't get caught. And I took that weed and went I, and, and into the bay and stashed it and was sitting there at my, at my house and then threw up, man. I was like, the adrenaline was, was so much adrenaline. It was in my system that it made me vomit. I said, whoa. I, 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 I laugh when I think of that shit, but I'm like, I don't want to do it today. Mm -hmm. For one, I'm too old. I wouldn't make it across. <laughs> I would fall and die. But that was the old times. You were, you were basically running for your life all the time. When I first met Pedro, mm -hmm. uh, you had just caught a case, and you mm -hmm. thought you were going to go away for a while. Yeah, I had. I had. Um, uh, uh, I had. Already, I caught a case prior, and I had. Uh, they had brought in the federal prosecutors to grab me on that. And so I ended up settling with a three year suspended. So I got a felony, I was able to wobble it, and then I eventually expunged it. But I had a three year fixed uh, 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 tag, and we got hit on an operation, and my brother took the heat. And I, was, I went down and checked myself, I went down and, and said, all right, I got the suspended, we almost will get this over with. So I uh, said goodbye to my friends and went, went down to the police station to go check myself in so I could get bussed off to prison. And I wasn't digging it because I was like, I had just spent almost three years to get all that crap straightened out and then that case went down. And that was over some bullshit too, man. That was over a neighbor that was pissed off at, at uh, some bullshit and caused some problems for my family. And it just did not turn out well. And, and that's, that's, the, that's what I don't miss either, is that you're, 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 people aren't really suffering from that same level of persecution where you get caught growing weed, you're typically not looking at you know, six years straight time. So you're not gonna get, that, that's like fed shit. So uh, it, was, it was hella frustrating. And my brother took the heat on it and he went to prison. And hopefully with the California expungements that'll clean it out. But you know, the whole thing was, uh, Jesus Christ, man. I wasn't digging it then and I don't dig it for anybody. The, the fact is, like, and you, you have to pay a price. Like, you want to ride the ride, you pay the price. 
But sometimes, man, the price you have to pay is unbelievable because they, they want to make a point. They want to prove a point. And then sometimes in the black market, uh, you can get robbed and... and murdered. Murdered, exactly. You get murdered. I, right, I know a, a bunch of people that got uh, dead. You had a Canadian friend, I remember. Well, he wasn't Canadian. He got killed by the Canadians. He was, he was, he was a um, Bay Area dude. And the, 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 the money was uh, owed to him. And instead of paying him, they just sent somebody down who uh, murdered him with a shotgun at his house during dinner. So he's eating dinner with his wife and his kid and the door rings and he goes and answers the door and gets murdered with a shotgun. So, you know, instead of paying him the cash, they just killed him. But Humboldt was filled with people that used to get killed that, because arm robbers are real and you have to be really smart. And if you're smart and you aren't taking risky chances, your chances are a lot better. But when you're, when you're holding boxes, people will kill you for a pair of socks. So a box of money is definitely incentive and, and that's why for a lot of people, you recommend to them. A lot of my friends used to say, you know, I want to get in the game with you. And I tell them, no, you don't want to be here. Because as cool as it is, as soon as you catch a case, you're going to find out how uncool it is. And as soon as one of your friends gets murdered, you're going to be like, what just happened? Because you're living this really killer life in the weed game. And then all of a sudden, real life intersects it. And that's why I think that, you know, for so many people, the ability to, to grow their own grass, let them smoke, um, the ability to pick it up from stores as long as we can get the prices down to where they belong and then get the prices up for the craft because it is better so you have the grading and prices you should have it'll normalize it and you'll you won't see a lot of that violence and uh, cannabis by itself is a beautiful product but that cash caused some issues for a lot of people and, and Humboldt had a lot of had a lot of cats that got uh, taken out from it and a lot of people feel now that they're getting peeled by uh, regulatory Oh, financially they are, well, they, and they're kind of emotionally getting killed too. They're getting killed in, in how much they're charging them because they're, the fees are unbelievable because they're, they're just putting on anything they can to get as much as they can from every, every, every place they touch you. So it's just a brutal cash beating, but it, it's an emotional beating because as you're going through the cash beating, you're so afraid that your way of life's going to disappear and you are powerless to fight it. And for a lot of people, because they didn't move on it quick enough, they didn't move on it like 10 years ago. They, they didn't quite catch that's, that's when they needed to make the jump. The whole counties can't cultivate. So now your, your financial shit's gone, your way of life's gone, you're angry, you feel minimized as a human, you feel uh, like you have no future, you know, all that crap. And, and they're feeling it and it's real. But you know, if you look at any industry that opens up, basically it's a free for all until they work it out. It's just, it's what it is. And, and I just, I made that realization years ago just to accept the fact that it's no longer what it was. And I really respect the perspective of uh, Nick over at 3C Consulting. I think his last name is Easy. Yeah, Sharpie. I know Nick. Yeah. I really admire his perspective. I met him in Germany. And he says, he talks about our industry being the last great industry in our lifetime. Yeah, it... What made it great was that it was filled with regular people who made irregular money. And so it was, it was it, I, think, I think that if you really took a look at like cannabis and, and its end, it really is the last of the other craft industries that ended car building, um, manufacturing, all the things that America used to do really well that got subbed out to other countries for cheap and all those people no longer have jobs. Cannabis is that last one of those components. And that's what's, I think, devastating is that cannabis really has, has caught so many people who used to do other jobs and now they can do cannabis work. But it's hard to survive on minimum wage, which is what most people are getting paid in cannabis. So, you, you know, you make it 15 an hour, I'm not sure where, where you can live. And to bring up that point, what would you like to see Humboldt get really good at uh, in order to shine uh, tomorrow? Oh Years shit! All Humble has to, Humble's already good at what they do. They're 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 good at it, and they've been good at it for a long time. They know how to grow good grass, and Humble produces a, from its environment good grass. What we need to do is work on uh, international and uh, U.S. export. And once we because Oregon just Oregon just tighten that up. So Oregon says we can import export. If once you see the states start to move it, product can move to other states. Once Humboldt has an ability to move its product around the world and around the United States, we're fine. 
And I really enjoyed your perspective last night. You were talking about how once you saw federal politicians on a federal level move into the cannabis space, that was a precursor to you. And for time, yeah, for, for, schedules for expediency. Coming. Because they wouldn't come into cannabis and, and give up the political um, cash cow for the cannabis cash cow if it wasn't a bigger cow. Why would they leave? Why, you, you, you don't leave an incredible job in politics to go into another job unless it's bigger. So when I started to see Speaker of the House, which is Boehner, going into New York, and I started to see these other congressmen shifting into other operations as consultants, I'm like, oh, this is on. They're, that's, that's, that's who's moving the tide is the political groups. And that's how the whole thing always works. And what we, we'll see is we'll see radical changes quickly. And that's what makes it to where you know, you're developing brands that have value. You're developing regions that have value. And that, I think, will, will work well. for The sad part about California is that it's got some other really good regions, too. The regions along the Sierras, up in Grass Valley area, um, really good growing. Good growing up there, too, you know? But they screwed them. So they don't get to they don't get to really work off of that model until they open those things up. But Humboldt, we're good. I think Humboldt's the only region that's bigger than California. I mean, you just said we got to think about global business. Yeah, well, Humboldt's Humboldt's. No matter where I go in the world, everybody knows Humboldt County. They don't say, uh, "Oh, I get my weed from Temecula." Oh, I get my weed from Sacramento. No, they're like, "I want to get weed from Humboldt County," and. It's a mate. It blows my mind. I don't care where I go. People know Humboldt County. So I just been in too many places that I wasn't promoting Humboldt. I just happened to be from Humboldt. And when people found out I was from Humboldt, it, it was everybody did the same little dance where they started all smoking weed and talking about the big plants. And I'm like, whoa, it is out there. So Humboldt has a chance to do some really good stuff in California as a state, as a known ag producer. But Humboldt's got an ability to produce some really killer grass, just like there's other some, there's some other good places too, man. You got, you know, you know, U.S. wide, um, you get up into the Michigan area, Ohio River Valley, you get down into Tennessee, you shift up into New England, you know, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. Those those have some really good um, some locations for growing good grass. The soil's good, the water's good, they got a good climate, but we just happen to have a really exceptional climate. Few places have, uh, no place has this air quality. And we have unbelievable water quality. And we have this Mediterranean season that's just savage. So it's the plants take off during the day, they build all their protection. At night, the temperature drops 50 degrees different, so the plants grease up. You know, Humble, Humble produces some good grass, period. And the world that wants sun-grown bio pot, this is one of those top places. And with the world that wants really high quality indoor, then they'll produce that too, but we can produce that in other places. You don't have to produce it here. And, and I'm not saying that there's not a demand for that, because there most certainly is. It's just that, you know, for this region, what would be best is uh, outdoor uh, uh, greenhouse cannabis grown biologically so that you are doing the least amount of impact to the region and you allow the world to come here to see it when they are able to connect it to Humboldt, and you allow those products to be on the shelves in other countries, you know? <laughs> and, and the way I see you, Kev, is somebody like, a, like an octopus. You got tentacles of perception, and you got your hands and your mind and oh, pretty much, in my opinion, practically every facet of the industry. And so switching gears just a little bit, um, are there any particular genetics that uh, excite you or that you're uh, looking forward to working on in the next 12, 18 months? Yeah, I'm look, I got, I'm, um, I've been doing this skunk project for a minute, and I took a pause on it for a sec, because like I said, I got, I got really ill last year, and it, it just really slowed down some of my extracurricular work. And then I got so busy with all the new permit stuff and trying to get all this other crap done that I didn't have the time. And so I'm looking forward to going in and, and digging back through that to mine some of those sexy California skunks. And I have some really killer, uh, uh, good Afghani lines that are beautiful old lines out of that region. I wouldn't mind pulling some of that up too. So first I'll finish with what I'm doing with the skunk work. And, and that's just really to get, you know, um, cannabis that, that makes you feel good. Beautiful, beautiful poly hybrids that makes you feel good. I'm not worrying about the, the numerics on it. I'm not worrying about making it so that it, it fits an extraction model. It's about catching a time period 
so that people who got to touch that time period get to enjoy some of that, that smoke, you know? So I want to finish that, and then I just want to work on that old Afghani line. A lot of the stuff, you know, I love a lot of the weed that's out in it because it's some killer smoke. But I, I, I notice as I get older, I want to go back in time to the things that, like when I was in Israel, I got to smoke some killer hash that was like the hash I used to get out of Boston in like 83. And it was, it had this flavor and I realized that, and I, we were saying this It brought years, you right back? It brought me right back. I was like, oh my God, it, I had a mouthful of that shit. And I was like, whoa, it, it's the impact of the, of the region on the product. And I didn't see the quality in the flower, but I saw it in the hash. And I was like, oh my God, it was so rich. And it, and it, it just took me back to a time and it just made me really happy to smoke it. And I just kept wanting to smoke more of it because I was so happy that I was smoking it again. And I think a lot of that is what I'm into because like I said, once you get older, you're not so caught up on what's trendy. You're, you're caught up on what you like. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't really give a fuck about trends anymore. You do if you're making sales. And like, so the stuff that I'm working on for projects, for business and direction, those things are, or things that you have me consult on, that's, that's what you want me to give you information on. But for like for me, what I'm working on, what I'm into, is old stuff from the past that was good so that I can go back to my youth and enjoy it. And it lets my demographic, 50 to 70, go back and enjoy it too. Is that what you'd call a res renaissance man? Yeah, to a degree. I think, you know, Renaissance man meant uh, awakened and meaning that you were, you were doing many things. And, and, and I'm, I'm, that's what we call like the green renaissance, you know, where, and that's what I've said for years that cannabis, we're going through a renaissance where you're allowing people to come out into the light and start to showcase craft. The renaissance is highlighted by the art, you know, and that's why I tell people like I'm a, I'm a preservationist. I'm not really a breeder. People don't catch what I'm saying. It just means that what I do is I, I hold stock for time so I can bank it. It's and, and I like how when we're trying to provide an authentic experience uh, to the world, uh, you're really uh, pulling genetics that were lost for periods of time. And, and like you're saying, you're, you're able to bring people back to, to a certain time where those genetics were prevalent. I think that's rare. When you have wine, you just hold on to it in the basement. And, and it wasn't such a dangerous thing to hold on to that bottle of wine yeah hold it no no it wasn't but holding the holding the herb was it was tough but you know when we lost way more than we kept so like you know some of the most beautiful stuff we ever got to touch is long gone and that's why we're trying to go back in and mine some of these things in in a deeper insight of of where to steer the plants in the breeding processes but a lot of it is just you know what you what, what you desire and i don't think it's the a, a renaissance so much that I'm doing it. It's a renaissance that we get to share it, that we get to actually normalize it, that we're able to, you know, we're, we're pre-Anslinger. We're, we're back when we could go smoke those marijuana cigarettes and nobody cared. You didn't have the drug war. You didn't have the persecution, you know, at least in the U.S. You know, you, you, you had an opportunity to share cannabis, normalize it. You didn't have to feel stigmatized if you smoked it. You didn't have to listen to people's crap. You didn't have to worry about them calling the cops on you. And it allowed you all to basically hold one variety, two, and you have 10 neighbors and they all have something different. And every year you just trade a pound. Because I mean, I used to do that years ago. I used to trade, I still trade pounds. Where, <laughs> where like, like my, home, my home weed, where I'm like, look, I got four pounds of, of this killer pure kush. Could I get a pound of that perp from you? And you would, you would be able to flip them so that you, you had now a diversity and you didn't have to grow so many different varietals. So you could have 24 different types of weed at your house, but you only grew six plants because you shared a couple ounces with the people around you and they shared their pot back. I mean, I used, I used to always have different that's herbs. A good point. It makes it really nice. That, like, that's the kind of stuff I dig about pot is that you're able to just focus and work on what you like most, what you're best at, and then you can trade and barter with people who also are into it. So it lets you have a great diversity and it lets you form nice relationships and cannabis again does the work. She's the one that's creating the bonds between you. Touching her allows you to find the common ground. And that's the kind of stuff that like I wanna see have happen. That it, the business of it, you know, we all wish we could go back to the fantasy days of 5G's a P. 
and that you could go make 400,000 out of your garage casually while you were um, mountain biking most of the time. But um, <laughs> that fantasy right there uh, is ended. I people ask me all the time, they get mad. that we want it to be what it was. I said, I'd like to be what it was too. I said, I wouldn't mind being 21 again, but I'm not. So I can't make it happen. I'm not in control. I just gotta accept what it is. But what I know is that what we can do is we can actually go back to having a freedom of cannabis uh, uh, relationship to where you're really sharing it amongst each other and you're able to experience cannabis in such incredible ways and smoke so much good cannabis. And if you're growing it yourself, you're not having to pay for it. You know, and if you're doing it biologically based in the ground, you're just really adding a small amount of mineral and, and um, fertilizer supplements to, to drive some of the food uptake. Oh, God's cheap, you know, small scale ag done right is not that expensive. So, I mean, that's what I'm digging, you know. I want to see people fire up some kill and then we get to share it up. And what I think is cool is what you're basically saying is for people to kind of soak in a little piece of humble culture into their own yeah. communities. Well, I would say that that's human culture because all across the world, people always did that. The people in the in the hills, I was in my mind, I'm really, you know, like identify as, 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 as having to go through the, the, the dope game as a black person because once you go into the drug business, you basically fit into the, the drug war and that was kind of waged against blacks. And so once you get into this, you start to understand the legal system a little different. But as a grower, I kind of associate myself with like Afghani people and, and uh, Pakistanis and stuff. Because up here in the hills when you're working, you go out and it's hot and dry and you're sitting there and you see this, the canyons unfold. And I always used to think back to like, that's what it must be like in Afghanistan where they're out there in the hills farming and growing dope and they're talking about how the crop last year was so much better than this year and how their neighbor sucks and how, how the other neighbors are way better grower. And, and I just said, it's, it's always been like this. And so those people grew the kill and then they would share the kill with their neighbors and the neighbors would have varieties they grew different than the ones you grew and you'd be able to share the material. So to me, it's cannabis culture from the, the past. Humboldt embodies it and really brought it out into the U.S. But we, we got it most definitely from all those other cultures. I mean, if you want to thank anybody, thank the slaves for carrying this crap over here in their bodies, risking death. Because if it's, if it's Jamaican weed, it's from Indians, from India, that came over there to be slaves and work. If you're talking anything that came over to the U.S., it was brought over from, from people who were being basically treated as slaves, Asians and Africans, and that risk they took to be able to partake in cannabis and, and how they shared it amongst themselves as this spiritual drug and a drug that allowed them to be able to handle hard life incredible you know and so i mean that's kind of really where the culture comes from to me this this embodies the present and then hopefully we create like a really good one where you have little pockets of free culture all over the u.s that lets people from all over the u.s put their little twist on it you know southern hospitality they wouldn't mind going in the south and smoking somewhere because they they know how to they know how to entertain and you'd, you'd be like wow these people are so nice and smoking in the south is so cool like in new orleans yeah or it'd be great it'd be great and that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to be able to see all, the, all the, the, the different regions in the U.S. embrace cannabis in the way that works for them. And the main point is that cannabis just allows people to find common ground so they can have um, a few moments of peace and connection with other people. Wow, man. Yeah. Uh, we covered so much ground, Kev. One. And, uh, you know, to be honest, nothing is, is coming to mind. I'm trying to think of a way to wrap this up. Um, we're, um, we're here in Humboldt. It's uh, my first time doing an interview uh, with the family, what I consider yeah, my extended yeah, yeah, family. Yeah. Um, what, what do you want uh, our audience to know about, um, about, about Humboldt, about, about the Humboldt that, that you want to see take shape uh, moving forward? Uh, In the future? That, that Humboldt's a beautiful place and that it has really beautiful people. For individuals to come here to experience it, it it's truly a, a natural phenomenon. And when it comes to access to cannabis and how people partake in it, you know, cultural phenomenon. And uh, don't be afraid to come visit. Hey, Kev, I got a lot, lot, lot of love for you, I love bro. Love you too, brother. This is an awesome interview. Thanks. Thanks.